Genesis 5. Help me out. I'll give you the clue, and you shout out the famous five. A, B, C. It's easy as one, two, three. That was a number one hit by the Jackson Five. If I greet you with a hand in the air, I might say, give me five, or high five. You may work these traditional hours from 9 to 5. When you need a break from work, you take 5. Ladies, perhaps you've worn this perfume, Chanel number 5. If you've ever dropped food on the floor, maybe you've observed this rule, the 5-second rule. You've determined to get your revenge. You want your five pounds of flesh. You have probably sung how on the fifth day of Christmas, your true love gave to you five golden rings. But the Fab Five we're most concerned about at this church recently are the five key attributes of Scripture. Can you name them? The Bible attributes of authority, truthfulness, clarity, necessity, and sufficiency. This is our fourth week studying Scripture on Scripture, things to know about your Bible. Good morning, church. Welcome, everyone. First time in returning guests, we are so glad you are here. My name is Lincoln, and something that you should know about Paulsbo Community Church we have seven core values that shape the way we pursue the mission God has given to us of passionately connecting this community to Jesus Christ so God is glorified and lives are changed forever. The first of those seven core values is there again on the top of your study handout provided in your worship packet, also available online. If you're joining this gathering online, a special welcome to you as well. We are reviewing this core value at the beginning of each of our five studies, the value of biblical authority. We repeat it here for no other reason than to remind ourselves that yes, please Lord, we want everything we do, say, think, and teach to be informed by and subject to the word of God. We want this as a church we want this as individual followers of Jesus, to hold dear the value of biblical authority. On your handout, five things to know about your Bible. Your Bible is authoritative, meaning all the words in Scripture are all ultimately God's words. All Scripture is breathed out, exhaled from God, and, and because God is true and truthful, his words are all true and truthful. Your Bible is true. We enthusiastically embrace the doctrine of inerrancy, that the Bible tells the truth about everything the Bible talks about, and there is no error in any part of it. Your Bible is clear, meaning that it can be understood, believed, and obeyed by ordinary people who are seeking God's will and willing to follow it. Your Bible is necessary you need your Bible. That's today's attribute of Scripture. And next week, we'll finish this series seeing that your Bible is sufficient, telling you enough so you can know how you get to heaven and how to live until you get there. This morning, our focus is this. The Bible is necessary. You need your Bible. In fact, you really do need your Bible right now. If you haven't already, would you please grab hold of a Bible, open your Bible app, and find Romans chapter 10. Yes, you can be on your phone in church if you're on your Bible app. No angry birds, please. Angry birds, angry pastor. This morning, we'll reference different scriptures, but I will have you looking up Romans 10, and later Psalm 19. If you forgot your Bible, we've got you covered. Romans 10 is on page 946 in one of our black Bibles underneath the chairs in front of you. While you're finding Romans 10, I don't know if this is true for every 
13-year-old boy, but it was certainly true for me, how it was so hard to wake up every morning and get moving and get ready for school. Guys, were you like this? My alarm would go off early in the morning, and I'd continue to lay in bed, still asleep with my alarm, still going off, until my mom would pound on my door shouting, Lincoln, wake up! Turn off your alarm and get out of bed. Even then, I would swing my legs out from under the covers and put my feet on the floor, yet I would continue to sit on the edge of my bed, staring out into the void, still half asleep. I'm so tired. I could sit like that for 20 minutes, my eyes partly open, until my mom pounded on my door again. Lincoln, get up. You're going to be late for school. I'm up, I'm up. And eventually I'd make my way to the shower, get dressed, and eat some breakfast. But boy, was I so slow getting going. Then, late one night, our roof was struck by lightning, causing an electrical fire on top of our apartment building. I heard the smoke alarm, But I thought it was my bedroom alarm going off, so for once I got up, still half asleep, with no idea what was going on. I made my way into the bathroom, and I turned on the shower. I thought, I've got to get ready for school. I'm going to be late for school. You can imagine that standing in a shower all wet is not a good place to be during an electrical fire. Now my mom was beating her fists on my bathroom door, shouting for me to get out of the shower. It's then that I noticed the strange smell, kind of like something was burning, and there were strange blue flames arcing out of the bathroom electrical sockets. Wrapped in a towel and half asleep, I opened the bathroom door to see my panicked mother holding my sister's hand. She explained that there was an electrical fire, and we needed to get out of the house right now. If you're asleep and there's a fire on top of your house, there's a couple of things you need to know. You need to know that there's a fire and your life is in danger. Wake up! There's a fire! The house is going to burn down and you with it. Then you need to know how to escape the fire so you'll be safe, so you will live and not perish. Now, let's walk through together Romans 10 verses 13 through 17. Paul explains to the Romans, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Jump to verse 17. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Now, bounce your eyes back up to verse 13. Paul assumes that one must call upon the name of the Lord, on the name of Jesus, to be saved. Saved from the fires of hell to the forever of heaven with God and his people. Verse 14. People can only call on the name of Jesus to save them, if they believe in him, if they believe the gospel message. And people can only believe in Jesus if they've heard of him. But they can't hear about Jesus unless there is someone to tell them about Jesus. Verse 17. Now faith in Jesus, saving faith, comes by hearing, hearing the gospel message, and hearing the gospel message comes through the preaching, the telling of that message. All this means that without hearing the Bible message that Jesus saves sinners so their sins are forgiven and they receive eternal life, without God's plan of salvation, especially revealed in the Bible, no one could be saved. Paul's not the only one who says something like this. Jesus says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Jesus also said, I am the way, 
the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Bible teaches that one can be saved exclusively through Jesus. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself up as a ransom for us all. But we wouldn't know that because of human sin. We need a divine Savior. We wouldn't know that Jesus as both the Son of God and a sinless human being. Jesus bridges the gap between us and God. We wouldn't know these things apart from the Bible, and we need to know them. Without the Bible, we wouldn't know that Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross and his supernatural resurrection from the grave were God's means, the only means for our salvation. We wouldn't know these things unless we had our Bibles, unless we read the scriptures ourselves or had someone else tell us what they contain. And for this reason and more, your Bible is necessary. On your handout, the necessity of the Bible means, first of all, you need your Bible to know some things you need to know and can't know any other way. How much can people know about God without the Bible? Do we need to read the Bible or have someone tell us what's in the Bible in order to know God exists? Uh, Do we need a Bible to know that we are sinners needing to be saved or to know how to find salvation? These are the kinds of questions that the doctrine of necessity asks and answers. On your handout, we are breaking out our definition of necessity. You need the Bible to know God's plan of salvation through Jesus Christ. This is the very need that Paul highlighted in Romans chapter 10. The Bible is necessary for knowledge of the gospel message. Only in your Bible has God clearly revealed the gospel facts. Romans 3.23, all people have sinned. Romans 6.23, the penalty of sin is death. Romans 5.8, Jesus Christ paid the penalty for our sins on the cross. In your Bible, the gospel invitation is presented. Turn from your sins and put your whole trust in Jesus for your personal salvation. And in your Bible, the gospel promises are made. Your sins will be forgiven and you will receive eternal life. There is no other way to connect to God than through the person of Jesus Christ. For there is no other way of dealing with our guilt before a holy God. These are the things God reveals only through his book, the Bible. You need the Bible for maintaining the life of your soul. On your handout, you need the Bible for maintaining the life of your soul. So I opened the fridge this week, it's still September, mind you, and there it was, a half gallon of eggnog. You've got to be kidding me. Honey, why is there eggnog in the fridge in September? My sweetheart answers back, because I need eggnog. Stephanie believes eggnog is a necessity. I disagree. No, no one needs eggnog in September. (laughs) But in fact, we do need the Word of God for maintaining the life of our souls. Moses told the Israelites, the Word of God It is your life. Jesus was quoting the Old Testament when he resisted temptation, saying, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus is saying we need the Bible because our spiritual lives are sustained by daily nourishment from the Word of God. Just like our physical lives are sustained by eating physical food every day. If you stop eating, eventually you die. To stop reading the Bible is hazardous to the health of our souls. You need your Bible for staying healthy and alive and for growing in your Christian life. On your handout, you need your Bible for having clear and definite statements about God's will. God has revealed his word to us so we can obey him and do his will. Life does come 
with an instruction book. And though the Bible doesn't tell us everything, it reveals enough for us to know how to live a life that is pleasing to God, keeping his commandments. If we are to have an undeniable knowledge of the Lord's will, then we must learn it through the study of Scripture, knowing that the words of Scripture are God's words. Because the words of Scripture are God's words, we can be more confident about the truths and instructions we find in Scripture than about any other knowledge and direction we receive from other sources. We need the Bible because nothing reveals God's will with greater certainty than the Bible. Now, there are two things we don't need the Bible for, according to the Bible. On your handout, you don't need your Bible to know God exists. For sure, without the Bible, people can obtain a knowledge that God exists and a knowledge of some of God's attributes simply by observing the world God has made. Acts 14. In past generations, God allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness. For he, God, did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. The rains, the seasons, the food, the gladness, all point to the existence of a creator who is good and generous. The Bible also says in Romans chapter 1, For God's invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So men are without excuse. Clearly, you don't need the Bible to know that God exists. And, on your handout, you don't need your Bible to know something about God's moral demands. One evidence of God's existence from the world he has made is the moral conscience he has written into the heart of every person. The Apostle Paul talks about how even unbelievers have a God-given moral compass, distorted and suppressed by sin though it is, yet it can direct a person to pursue what is right and convict a person who chooses the wrong. Let's put this definition of the necessity of the Bible all together from Wayne Grudem's Introduction to Systematic Theology. The necessity of Scripture means that the Bible is necessary for knowing the gospel, the way of salvation, for maintaining spiritual life, and for knowing God's will. But it is not necessary for knowing God exists or for knowing something about God's character and moral laws. This would be a good place to compare what theologians call general revelation versus special revelation. It's also a good place to take a look at Psalm 19, which references both general revelation and special revelation. Please flip back in your Bibles from Romans chapter 10 to Psalm 19. Psalm 19 is on page 456 in our Black Bibles. Psalm 19 begins with a celebration of God's works in creation. Verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. Now, in verse 7, see the psalm shift from a celebration of God's works in creation to God's words in the Bible. Verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. 
More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. It's like David, the author of this psalm, is saying, if you think God makes his presence known in an awesome way through his creation, then just check out God's word and see what it can accomplish in the life of someone who meets the Lord in his book. The first part of Psalm 19 exemplifies general revelation. On your handout, general revelation, what we mean is what God has generally revealed about himself to all persons through the world he has made. General revelation comes through observing nature, through seeing God's directing influence throughout history, and through an inner sense of God's existence and his laws that he has placed inside of every person, their moral conscience. General revelation is different from special revelation. Special revelation, on your handout, is what God has specifically revealed about himself through the words he has spoken which are recorded in the Bible. And here's where I want to reaffirm our need for the Bible. The Bible nowhere suggests that people can know the gospel, the way of salvation, through general revelation. On the bottom of your handout, we are wanting to make this doctrine of necessity personal and practical. Reviewing the doctrine of necessity. We reaffirm that salvation is only the result of having heard of Jesus and trusting in him. You need your Bible to know some things you need to know, and you can't know any other way. At the top of the can't know any other way list is the gospel of Jesus, who is the way of salvation. Another scripture, Acts 4.12 and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus is the only one who ever died for our sins, or could have done so. You meet Jesus so he makes himself known and changes your life when you meet him in God's book. The Bible is very clear that no one can come to God except through Jesus Christ. Now, the question that inevitably comes up, the question I ask myself is, what about those who haven't heard? What about the ignorant who don't have a Bible, so no one has ever shared the gospel with them? What about the islander in the South Pacific who knows nothing of Jesus? He's never met a missionary. He's never got his hands on the scriptures. What about those persons who, because of some limitation? They are incapable of reading and understanding the Bible. What about the infant who dies before or after birth? Great questions. Great questions for future studies. But the short answer is, in all these cases, with all these persons, we trust in God's fairness and goodness for those who haven't yet heard the gospel. Two things to remember when we talk about salvation and God's judgment. Number one, no one deserves to be saved. By virtue of being human, the guilt of the very first man's sin belonged to me even before I was born. It's a sinful nature that I inherited from Adam, a sinful nature which I have been very good at demonstrating in my own life. I don't deserve salvation, and I never did. And no one does. Salvation is a gift that God gives as he wills. And it can never be earned. Number two, the Bible teaches that God will judge the world fairly and righteously. Acts 17.31 says, he will judge the world in righteousness. It is God's desire to show his mercy. So when we enter into eternity... God who is merciful and God is, who is just, no one will be able to accuse him of unfairness. When someone asks me about the person who has never yet had a chance to hear about Jesus, how will they get to heaven? My response is twofold. Number one, good question. And number two, be careful you don't use that good question as an excuse for you 
not coming to Jesus. Because now you do know what God has done for you in Christ, so you no longer have any excuse not to respond to the gospel. If we appreciate the need people have for the Bible on your handout, we are highly motivated to share the gospel with those who don't yet know. Are we really concerned about lost people who are ignorant of what the Bible teaches? We can do something about it. We can invest ourselves in the work of the church to be witnesses to the truth about Jesus and be a part of making new Christians, letting others know that, yes, Jesus saves. You know, there's that stupid joke about the man who prayed from on top of his house. He was on the roof when a flood came. And he prayed that God would rescue him. Every time someone came along to rescue the man, he refused, insisting that he was waiting for God to rescue him. The man dies in the flood and then complains to God, God, I trusted you. Why didn't you save me? You know this joke. God answers back, what do you mean? Why didn't I save you? I sent you, you know, what is a life raft and a helicopter and a boat. But you turned them all away. Now, Here's a connection to today's study. What if I complain, God, if people need the Bible in order to understand who Jesus is and be saved by him, then why don't you send them a Bible? Send them uh, someone with a Bible so they can hear the gospel and be saved. How might God answer that complaint from me? Lincoln, I'm sending you to them. Uh, Bill, I'm sending you to them. Jim, I'm sending you to them. Uh, Sheila, I'm sending you to them. You have my word. I've entrusted you with the gospel message. Now you take it to the person who doesn't yet have it. You get to be a part of it. God's plan is for you to reach lost people so they can be found by Jesus. It's a blessing and it's a responsibility that he's given to all of us. How do I know that? Well, because it's in the Bible. It's one of the many things that the Bible says is God's will for us. If we want to know God's certain will for our lives, we need to be in our Bibles. You need to be in your Bible. Listen now. Let me tell you something that happens to all of us at one time or another. We read something in the Bible about God's will for our lives, and we're not feeling it. I understand what the Bible says here, but if I do what it says... Or if I stop doing what it says not to do, obeying God's word is going to put me at odds with my own desires and emotions, at odds with my own ideas of what I think is best. Maybe your friends or your family are telling you that pursuing what the Bible says is not in your best interests, or it's not practical for you to obey God in this particular case, given your particular circumstances. (laughs) Don't listen to them. Here's what the doctrine of necessity cautions us. Sometimes God's wisdom revealed in the Bible and the world's wisdom will come into conflict. So you need to decide now, when that conflict does take place, who are you going to listen to? Whose voice is best for you to obey? If we want to know God's certain will for our lives, so when those hard decisions come our way, We are ready to make them because we have what we need, God's word in the Bible. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how incredibly blessed are we that we would have access to your word, that you would make yourself known to us, not only in the world you have made, but in the words you have spoken in our Bibles. In your word we find truth to believe, commands to obey, and promises to hold on to. Some of us are seeking your direction for our lives right now. We are desperately in need of hearing your voice. Lord, please meet us as we open the pages of your book. I have friends in this room, friends who are watching online, and there's a decision to be made, a a fear that is overwhelming, a question that needs answering. Jesus, would you show us what we need to see Holy Spirit, would you lead us as we trust you with all of our heart and lean not on our own understanding. In all our ways we will acknowledge you, believing that you will make our paths straight. 
In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Thank you.